Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Please uh, go ahead and take your seats. Let me remind you to uh, turn off, silence your phones right now. I'm David Ramsey. I serve as chair of the Ruben O. Diaskew Department of Government. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. But first, a few words about the name at the top of your programs. Ruben Odiaskiu served as governor of this state from 1971 to 1979. He was the first Florida governor to serve two full four-year terms in office. Though born in Oklahoma, we claim the governor as our own here in Pensacola because he moved here during childhood and after he'd studied law in Gainesville, he moved back and started his law practice. Many of you, are familiar with his firm, which bears such a prominent place in our skyline today, Levin Papantonio. Governor Askew was a close friend of the late Fred Levin's father, David. Like so many in this area, Askew valued military service, serving as a naval intelligence officer during the Korean War. After serving in both houses of the legislature, yeah. Culminating in a two-year term as President Pro Tem, he was elected governor in 1971, winning 57% of the vote. His accomplishments in office were wide-ranging. I can name a few. Uh, he oversaw the desegregation of public schools and implementation of busing. He secured passage of the state's first corporate income tax and increased homestead exemptions at the same time. He oversaw the reapportionment of, slate, of state legislative districts following the Supreme Court's ruling in Reynolds versus Sims. An advocate for transparency in government, Askew secured passage of the Sunshine Amendment, an early attempt to shine a light on the role of dark money in our state politics. This was the first amendment to the state constitution that was ratified by voters rather than the legislature and it secured more than 75% of the popular vote. Askew cultivated a public reputation as a teetotaling, church-attending politician who didn't smoke, didn't cuss, and opposed gambling in all of its forums. He was known by friends and adversaries as Reuben the Good. We find in Askew's record of public service a welcome example of a successful politician who did not set aside his integrity in order to secure political power. In the words of one of his political adversaries, he has established a kind of morality in office that causes people to have faith in government. Perhaps it's for this reason that a study of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government ranked Askew as one of the 10 best American governors of the 20th century. We commemorate his legacy tonight with this talk. Now, in just a moment, I will welcome to the stage our speakers, but first I should introduce them. Dr. Alfred Cousin is our distinguished university professor of government. He's published articles and book chapters on a variety of topics during his career here at UWF. Most recently, a book, The Laws of Politics, Their Operations in Democracies and Dictatorships. After serving as department chair for two decades, he now teaches regularly in both our graduate and our undergraduate programs. And in 2016, received a Fulbright to teach in Estonia at the University of Tartu. Next to him is Richard Hagen, Professor Emeritus of Civil Engineering at the University of New Mexico, with whom Dr. Cousin has collaborated frequently over a 40-year career to analyze questions of government scope, fiscal policy, and elections. We'll hear more about their research in just a moment. And batting cleanup, as it were, is Joseph Colomere, who holds dual appointments at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and the Autonomous University of Barcelona's Institute of Political and Social Sciences. During his distinguished career, Professor Colomere has published widely in the field of comparative politics. The record of his published books and articles, book chapters, uh, runs to more than 200. His next book, out this July, studies the American constitutional order as a source of our current political divisions. Following the presentation of Professors Cousin and Hagen, Professor Colomere 
will provide some commentary and analysis of their work. Each of you also have important work to do this evening. It's our practice in the Department of Government when we invite speakers on occasions like this to require them to stand for questioning after they're done. So right now, as you prepare to listen to their remarks, I encourage you to think as you're taking in the speeches, what is my question? What would I ask, if I, if I could, these speakers to address? I mean, maybe their comments provoke something in your mind. Um, and so remember, you have work to do once their work is done. My work is done. I've completed introductions of our speakers. Please join me in welcoming to the podium our three speakers. Thank you all very much for coming. I asked my colleagues um, in the Department of Government uh, when I first uh, did the first draft of my presentation, um, I said, what do you think of that title? Does it tell you anything? Does it, can you figure out what it means? And I never got a response. <laughs> um, and you know, we, I, I, I always teach my students, pick, uh, pick a, a title that is sort of like uh, catchy, you know, that will catch people's attention. And they give a subtitle that actually is substantive, that actually, are you hearing me okay? Uh, that, is, that, that is substantive, okay. Uh, that is substantive that actually describes what the paper uh, is all about. So I, I, did, I did, hopefully I, I, I succeeded in my, in my first, um, uh, with, uh, I succeeded in the purpose of my time. All right, so this is uh, the product one product of a collaboration that I've had with uh, Richard Hagen for a number of years. Uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Ramsey said, over instead of 40 years, every 10 years or so, we kind of get together and you know get going, and then shh, you know I do I go my way, he goes his way, and then 10 years later he can do it again. Um, and so, but I think this time, I think it's probably um, in my biased opinion. Uh, I think the best work we're, we're, we're doing, uh, the best work, I think, uh, but, but, but it's not finished. It just, it's kind of work in progress. So how did an engineer and a political scientist, or politologist, as I like to call myself, um, get together? Well, what happened was that uh, we were both teaching in New Mexico. He was at, in Albuquerque at the University of New Mexico, and I was at New Mexico State in Las Cruces. And I was, interest, I was interested in water, and he's a engineer who studies also water resources economics. So we happened to go to the same seminar uh, in Austin, and on the way back uh, from the um, seminar, you know, we happened to see one of those random events <laughs> uh, that uh, brought us together, sitting next to each other. And so what am I to do in the next hour? So I pulled down an article I was working with. I said, what do you think of this? And he said, oh, that looks kind of something like I've done. You know, it's, it's suggests some of the things that I have done in water resources economics. So that's it. Uh, that launched a number of articles uh, that got published. And the other day he was telling me how he, he took these articles when he was applying for a professorship. And he took the articles to uh, the political science department at um, New Mexico, and say, what do you think of this? Are these legitimate? <laughs> the guy said, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, so um, over the last 10 years or so, I, be, I began to get interested uh, in, in elections worldwide. And uh, it's one of those weird things that happens. You gotta get interested in something, and you say something in class, and, and the next thing you know, you're, and, and I don't really can't remember how these things came to me. It's kind of weird. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has that experience, but the next thing I know, I'm writing an article and I got published in a, in a, in a journal that is not the most prestigious, but it's the most widely read uh, in the discipline. And then I did another one and another one and another one. And, um, and so then um, after some tr time to several tries to get uh, Richard interested in, in working with me and some more on this. He, he, finally, he finally picked up and so we did. 
So what am I gonna do today? Well, there is something in the study of, of elections um, that is titled, but it goes by the phrase, the cost of ruling or the cost of governing. And this is the cost in votes that the party in office incurs in, in office. In other words, there's a certain, you might say, it, it pays a price in votes for exercising power. And um, the pioneers in this work were two, two European uh, economists, actually, political economists perhaps, uh, uh, Peter Nanestad and Martin Paldam. Um, and they published a paper, actually, and it eventually became, uh, it sort of, uh, was republished as a, as a chapter in a, in a book. And they came up with the, they studied uh, all, all, well, about 18 uh, developed democracies in Europe, Japan, Australia, uh, and North America, and they came up with a, a number. They said that on average, the incumbents uh, lose 2.25% points, percentage points, uh, but it's per term per term. So that's, you know, a lot of people have followed up on that, uh, a lot of estimates, a lot of estimates coincide more or less. So another political scientist from England, his name is Ian Budge, uh, he kind of summarized it all by saying, uh, the most uh, widely tested uh, inductive law in political science is that governments lose two to three percent percent, two, per, two to three percent of the vote percentages of the votes, points of the votes per term. So it's kind of a well-established. So the first thing we need to do is, is find out whether we can reproduce what uh, Nathan and Palman said. So, uh, so uh, this is an attempt to uh, reproduce Nathan and Palman's work, and we now have more countries, more elections over a longer period of time, and here we go, between two and three percent of, of the, this is, this is what they lose, per term, average, all the votes that they, the net votes, right, that's a vote and all, the, all through, and then average the loss over all the terms they're in office, and you come up with two to three percent. That's at the national level where they tested it, and then here is at the subnational level, it's a little bit higher, right? So the overall, the, the across average there, you can see that it's about, well, yes, it's 2.7, so three percent, and here is a little, a little more three percent. So that's how we start, right? But we think that uh, this is uh, accurate, as far as it goes, it's correct. But we think it is not a true representation, uh, a useful representation of the phenomenon. We think that the, it hides more than it actually shows. So, um, so what we did, and this is, uh, I give all the credit to Richard here, because I said to him, Richard, <clears throat> I want you to look at this data here, because I, I, I see that the function, it appears to be the little bump. Uh, the party is elected, and if it's re-elected, it gets a little bump in the vote, and then, and then eventually, eventually the dam breaks, and, and it kind of, you know, they, they lose. So he looked at that and he said, you know, I don't think there is a bump. And, and neither do I think that it's kind of an incremental, because the idea of a two, a two to three percent per term gives the impression that there is kind of an incremental loss, right, of the vote over the time of the, the, the incumbents are in office. So I said, I don't think that's the way it works. So we began to back and forth, back and forth, you know how collaborative work goes. And so what we found, so, uh, so that's the next thing I'm gonna show you is, well, this, is, this tells you all the, all the elections that we have studied, okay, uh, all together, it's about over 2,000 elections, uh, 1,800 uh, elections at the subnational level, uh, 500 elections at the national level. Now, spells. Uh, spells is basically um, the, the series of terms, consecutive terms, that a party is in office, right? So, for example, uh, President Roosevelt, well, it's not, a, it's not a person, it's a party, okay? So, for example, to give a long one, it would be like the Democratic spell, election in 1932, and they were in office until 1952 when they lost. So 20 years, five terms, okay? So that's a spell. Now a spell can go from only one term, which is actually the most, the most frequent, uh, to two, three, four, and up to many more terms, okay? Up to 
10, even more in some, in some cases, or some unusual cases, okay? So we got uh, a total of um, almost 900, around 900 spells and almost two, two, over 2,000 elections. So we have a lot of data, but we concentrate our analysis on the subnational because we have so many data points. And if you're gonna establish a relationship, you really have to have a lot of, a lot of data points, so to speak. Right? So, our next slide. Okay, so here's, um, on, on, unlike the, the first slide I showed you, that is a per term loss, this one is a total loss, okay? Total loss. And so this is uh, the five countries we, work, we, we have been working with the most. Uh, these are the sub-national level, state or provincial elections. And we began with Australia, Canada, and the USA, then we added Germany, and then we added India. And this is what we find. Uh, we find that, um, we find two, two, two things you, sh you see in this, in this slide. The green represents elections. Re-elections, I should say, re-elections. The red represents defeat. Defeat comes at the end of the term, at the end of the spell. That's what ends the spell when they lose the election, right? They lose the last attempt at re-election. And so we see uh, that uh, in, in a couple of cases, uh, the incumbents actually gain a little uh, during re-elections, uh, but the bulk, almost all of the loss occurs when they lose the election. So one thing we have done with this to begin with is there is no such thing as an incremental loss, you know, in a stepwise, sort of step-by-step, step fashion uh, over the course of the spell. They basically, they go, and then, and Richard, we're gonna show, show you more on that. Kind of stay, stable, and then boom, like this. So that's why cruise, the election, the, the incumbents cruise, right? And then they crash. They cruise and they crash. Now here, um, in this slide, we're showing you a little bit different because first was the total uh, cost. Now uh, I want to show you the fact is that different countries and different systems of government, the two principles being parliamentary versus presidential, or as I call them, uh, cabinet versus executive, they have different votes at the beginning. So a 10% point loss when your average 40% is a lot more than a 10% point loss when you get 50%. And the presidential governments, they get higher votes than the parliamentary ones. So what we have to do, well, we have to standardize the total loss by uh, their, 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 the average of their wins, okay? So what we find uh, is that Basically, when you do that, on the average across the countries is about very close to 20%. 20 they lose when they crash 20% of their average win vote. Okay, now that's, when you hear 20%, that's supposed to two to three percent point per term. When you hear 20%, now, now you get to see a real amazing, you know, it's a much more impressive number than two to three percent per term you're losing 20% of, of the vote that you won when you first got elected or the average of the win vote when you get reelected. Now, this uh, slide shows you it's the same proportional change, right? But now what we wanna show you, because the other one was kind of static, right? They just show you the total, and now we're showing you what happens uh, when, during the course of a spell. So a spell, like I said, consists of a number of terms or elections, right? So in each, each of these vertical panels, you see that it says election from election zero to five, 10, 15, and in some cases, that's about the maximum, but very close to the maximum. So we, what, we're actually, what we're showing here, and let me see if I can use the, the pointer now. I think I can do this, right? There, sorry. <laughs> All right. So, see this line here? 
This line is the average, okay? The same average that I showed you in the previous slide, roughly about 20%. Um, they're a little different, of course, but roughly the same 20%. But what I'm showing you here is not just the 20%. What I'm showing you here is that there is no, no difference on average uh, between losing uh, your, your cost when you, ha when you uh, lose uh, one election when you last only one election or you last 15 elections. It's flat. This is flat. You, there's no relationship. If there, were a relation, if there were a relationship, you will see this going up, the numbers, the, the dots going up, or if there were a negative relationship, it will be going down. But notice, some go up, some go down. So on average, it's flat. What does that tell you? That there is no, on average, there is no difference. There, it doesn't really matter when you lose. On average, you, you incur the same cost, about 20%. Okay, now this one is the last, the last slide I will show you. I'm taking two turns. The first turn, then uh, Richard takes over, and then I come back. So in this one, it's a little bit more complicated, but, and I want to, by the way, I want to thank um, Michelle Williams, my colleague, because she introduced the whole department to Tableau, but I was the only one who kind of, you know, really enjoyed it, and and I have used Tableau. You know, it's, it's a great, it's a great program to analyze electoral data. So, you know, thank you, uh, Michelle. Uh, it's taken me several years because it's trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. But anyway, so what I'm showing here uh, is um, a number of a number of things are shown in this very complicated, but really complicated, but really illustrative uh, chart. All right, so the blues represent the number of terms. Okay, so you can see, and this is for the U.S. only, because we have the most data for the U.S. So uh, basically, uh, U.S. Um, governments, U.S. administrations at the gubernatorial level, they, they basically, the most frequent uh, uh, terms are either one term or two terms. So you will either only uh, last one term or you last two terms, and then that's it. Then after that, you just decline it like this, okay? And this, this decline here is something that Richard will explain uh, with, a, with a somewhat different chart. So I won't, I won't get into it now. Okay, so uh, here, that number there is the vote uh, at the last election where they lose, right? Because you, you only serve one term, that means you lost, and when you lost, you lost with 44% of the vote, and you lost 7.8 points. What does that tell you? That tells you that they, they had, when they went into the last election, they had 51%, right? So this is what they had when they lost. This is the, the actual number that they, that they lost, that the, the crash, uh, which is uh, in, 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 in points, not in percentage points. Uh, and so, so look, look how, look how these this numbers don't vary very much, right? So uh, they, when they lose, they lose pretty much about the, by the same um, uh, number of votes. Uh, and when they get reelected, about the same as we, and, and, as she, she, uh, and Richard will show you this. But here are hints, there are hints of that when you look at this, when you look at this chart. So in the blues, uh, you're showing uh, how many, this is, this is the number of terms, right? So how many administrations lasted one term, how many lasted two terms, and then how many lasted three, four, five, and so on. And at the top, what vote, what vote did they take in when they lost the election? They, they, the spell closed. And, and how many points they had, how many points they lost? So that's the vote they had. They, they came up with that vote, and that represented an eight point loss, a 13 point loss from the, uh, for the mean of, of the previous wins. Now, what about this? Right. Well, this shows you uh, the, uh, the, 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 the proportional cost. So you can see that for the most part, uh, they go, that was a little bit less, that's a little bit less, but 20, 19, 24, 22, 19, 18, 20, 20, so very, very similar, right? So the, again, there's no relationship, right? No matter how many times, how many elections you survive, when you, when, you, when you crash, you crash by about the same percentage of your vote, okay? And I did this for the cabinet, uh, for the parliamentary government. The same thing. You can see the same thing here. Now, none of the parliamentary governments, uh, you can see that one term is the most common. Right? 
Uh, but note that in the parliamentary governments, they, they, uh, they lose with 30% of the vote, 31, 32, 33, very, very similar, very, very similar. So there's, there's no relationship here. They're you know, up and down, up and down, but basically. Uh, and, and again here, the, the, the crash. This is, the, this is the, the percent point crash is right there, and that is the, uh, the proportional crash, right? Uh, the, the, the one that we think is uh, the, the, tr represent the, the best way of representing the, the true cost uh, of, uh, of governing. And this will come later. So uh, I'll stop now and I'll come back later when Richard has uh, done his presentation. Thank you for your attention. Well, I'd like to thank Al for inviting me. Uh, as you'll quickly figure out, uh, I'm a civil engineer. I know nothing about political science. And, uh, but I think that's to my advantage in this situation because the less I come in with, maybe by some kind of odd coincidence, the more I might see. So why don't we have the first slide that'll just say that I'm doing. Uh, there we go, part two. There's the meeting down there. So you can hang on I'll say, let's, let's have the next slide uh, right away. Uh, this looks formidable. I'm going to simplify this way down. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask two questions, which are the questions I was talking about. When in the next election, and then what those should win by. I'm going to employ two statistical distributions, which will be very simple. You say, oh my goodness, I didn't think statistics. You don't need statistics to understand these things. Uh, the data, I'll talk about where we got all this stuff. Yeah. Technology challenge here. Let's try if this thing works. Okay. Uh, where did Al get all that stuff he told you? We'll see. Uh, what data do we need to pull out of that? We'll see. Fairly simple statistics. Uh, how we're going to test it. So you don't need to worry about this, but this is kind of my uh, plan of attack. So why don't we have the next slide? Forward one. Oh, we're going to talk about first spells. I'll define it, but I'm going to show you the spells. So you sit in your mind. I want you to have a picture of it. I want you to see, remember what you said. Uh, I'll talk about exponential distribution, which you say, what's that? And I'll say, uh, have you ever heard of radioactive decay? He said, oh yeah, uh, you know that one already. Uh, something that we developed that would be extremely engineeringly is take a complicated question, part of it, and bring it down to a small diagram to focus on what you want to see. Okay, so, and you'll see what that is immediately. Uh, and then uh, I'll progress as time allows how we turn that into actually a book count. Okay, right, next slide. Okay, this first slide, those of you in political science, think it's a political science slide, a picture. Uh, nothing wrong, the re uh, Ben Franklin stole it. Okay, Th this was actually drawn by Socrates and a student Aristotle drew this one. These are just recently discovered underneath uh, uh, in the pyramids, I believe, uh, by Harvard up here, like archaeologists. Okay, Socrates was one about ideas. And so his idea was you have these top loops, we don't want to get that one yet. We have this complicated life, okay. Uh, let's link all these things together. So he was big on, don't worry about reality as much as the real thing, it's just the best we do is get the ideas together. Uh, uh, his student Aristotle had the same problem, uh, same question here, but he was much more the first, he wasn't a scientist yet, but he was much more, let's look at some data, let's look at the reality, let's cut some little pieces and see what they look like, let's find out why toads are different than caterpillars. Okay, that didn't bother Socrates at all. Okay, so uh, there's Al right there. Join it together, put it in a big picture, uh, and if you send, send the big picture, the details will come. No argument on my part at all, okay? But here's the engineering side of the thing, is to do that, it can be beneficial to back away from it, chop into little pieces, not put the big picture, study little pieces, and then see what the big picture looks like. So we're gonna, and it takes two to, Two to time, it takes two to make research work. It's not one and not the other. Okay, so next slide. Uh, I brought several uh, show and tells. Uh, first, which I'll show at the right, right time, I brought a weighted coin. You don't know, but I glued a, a washer on one side. Okay. And I bought uh, a dice. I said I made two colors two reds, no, no, two blacks and four reds. Okay. That's for part of it. 
After I do that, that's where my part A. I'm going to get into some statistics. Uh, and to do that, I brought a bell shaped curve. So you all know what I'm talking about, because I'm going to cut it. What you don't know about is that I'm going to cut it in half. Okay, and according to Professor Fletcher back there, maybe that's never been done before. I've never heard anybody, why would you want to do that? Well, I've heard you mean you're going to do it. And then a balanced it. So that'll be here in our statistics. Okay, but to talk about spells, I went back to that uh, uh, definition I gave you, and, let's, and, and so uh, let's remember this guy. I, I actually brought one of these, and I brought a meat cleaver. I said, cut it in the sections, but we got loose, and so it's it's <laughs> more you can see it. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are next. Uh, all the Okay. These are the some nationals would be provinces or the equivalents in whatever country you're in, uh, you know, Queensland or something, Canada, Alberta. Okay, and like like that snake I saw. These are the spell histories. With it, that I can't read it. That would be uh, uh, twenty elections. So in so whatever this says, I need to read them one, two, three, four, five, six. They had six spells in about twenty elections. <laughs> okay, Canada is a big set. Okay, just for what it's worth, if our spell started and it was open to the history before it, we don't use it. Okay, because we don't know how long it was there before. It's better just to not use that spell than to say, oh, it must have started today. Okay, if our spells were in it and our data set, if, if somebody was in office and hadn't had been there and hadn't lost, we don't say, well, you lost now, we're going to use you, we just throw that out. So my home state of Oregon uh, lost a bunch of data because we haven't had a Republican governor for, uh, since 1978. Okay, so we don't get to count that, it's a long run. Okay, Florida lost because whenever the party had started, and I don't know what it was, you had a long string of the previous of the same party. I've been Democrats, I don't know who was out. Okay, so we, we, we could have more spells if we, if we wanted. Let's have a nice stuff set. Uh, okay, we're going to see Germany here in a second. Uh, a few German, two of these are pretty bizarre. Some of these countries, just some of the provinces in Germany, especially, I think the ones that had more of a traditional kind of conservative bent to them, they just sat, let these guys sat with the same party for 15, uh, 15 years. I've never heard one spell for 15 years. Okay, let's go to the US, my treasure trove. This is half of the U.S. states, and you'll see, and I, back to the same picture, you'll see a lot of states. This snake, well, it's kind of looks better. Uh, maybe this snake, that looks kind of like that red and black one I had. Because uh, it's kind of, a lot of them are, are pretty uh, uh, back and forth. Let's have an excellent second half, like you. Uh, well, let's well, okay, the last one showed the, let me go back, it showed the rest of the states. A lot of data in those states. Okay. Because every spell has its own history. Okay. Uh, those are some nationals. We did the same for nationals, the presidents, the prime ministers, or the winning party things for 23 countries, uh, four of which we also had the previous subnationals, so we'll compare those. So a lot of data. Let's have the next one. This is 23 developed uh, countries. Okay. I plotted it out. Okay, I took, I'll show you a picture in a second, but I'll show you uh, what, what I did. Take all the spells, let's put all the U.S. spells together. How many two, how many one spell governments did we have? A whole lot. Okay. How many two spell governments did we have before it changed? Not quite as many. How many three spell governments? Well, not more. And the number gets down. Okay. Now, when I plotted that data, and I'll show it to you in a minute, I got a curve that looks like this. And in the back of my mind, I said exponential, exponential. Well, actually, if I had been smarter, I would have said geometric, geometric, because that's the, these are not continuous data, but that's a small point. Uh, you know how that curve works, and we'll see it. We'll see if it works for our data. I'll show you in a second. Uh, Radioactive data goes. I know it from hydrology. I work in the my Bread and butter is, is the interface between hydrology and hydraulics. Give me a good flash flood. I just have to so <laughs> If I was 
here, I would be working heavy duty on floods from uh, uh, hurricanes. But in New Mexico, the flash floods down the road, it's a self disobeying people. Pure as a man. This is a, this is a, this is a uh, overtime on the rate of infiltration over here. This is like inches per hour. So if you watch the water go into a tube, it's sucking the ground, it goes slower and slower over time. Uh, it's called the Horton equation. It's a great example because there's no theoretical basis for this. There's no natural law that says it's supposed to be that way. It's not. That's the, that's the input, that's the mix of a whole bunch of physical laws with fluid mechanics. Okay. Uh, but as we're going to make the point, we don't have to have an explanation why we have a curve if the curve shows what's going on. Uh, 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 games of chance. Okay, uh, classic. How many times are you going to have a chance of getting uh, a red card if you dispute about? How many times are you going to have a chance of getting a full house? All those are, all those are just, and there aren't all exponential, but the, the red card one would be. Or if you're the family planning, what's your chance of having your second kid the same gender? And then your third kid again the same gender, it, it goes down by chapter two, one half, one eight. Okay. Uh, one paper that I found, uh, written in Italian, so I don't know what they said, uh, <laughs> seemed to fit on the subject, and that's all we found. So I'm simply going to say uh, there wasn't really this interest in this explanation, exponential distribution in uh, uh, political science and Is that the next slide? Okay. Uh, first, the math. All you need. Is this equation here? You don't need this. Is if you're going to do more mathematical derivations, forget it. You don't need to do that. Okay. And it just says, give me a k of 0. 0.7. You say, okay. If I have 100 today, after once one time unit, which is an electric cycle, I'll have 70 left. If I go another uh, time cycle, so I'm two out, I'll seven point seven times seven. I'll have 49 left. If I go another, go you know, three time cycles, I'll have. 0.7 to 49, which is a tad under uh, uh, 35 percent left, and then down into the 20s. That's I mean, down. And so the, the, the 0.7 I just gave you, uh, which, which is a number that we're going to sort of see, it's another example, looks like that. The bigger the K, the slower the K. This says you have 90 percent left at one time. Out uh, this down here says you have uh, uh, 20 percent less. Okay, don't worry about this. I worry about it. Give me so if you understand what K is, it's a portion step to step. Uh, you go the other way. Uh, you don't understand that on that. No. Let's see the next step. Uh, one more. Okay, here's the data. These are the U.S. subnationals. I like that data set because it's a big data set. Okay, so this gets really iffy when you start looking at these little runs with seven data points. Yeah, hundreds in the U.S. It was six, uh, six. And when I made this, it was six hundred. Uh, uh, Spells start with not even close to a thousand. Uh, to check. Okay, everybody wins the first election. That's what we call E zero. Okay, come election two or the after your first re-election is the second bar. Okay, <coughs> this many won it. That many lost it. Okay, so everybody is still there, but some now go away. One more election. This many won it. That many lost it. This is real data. Okay. Uh, what you can't do is just compare these. I just want to put in a little teaching moment here. Never take this data and just say, well, let's just do you know, all the, the ratios between bar number seven and bar number eight. You'll get garbage like this. Okay. And the reason it's garbage is because when you get down here, you're talking about very few points. Okay. And so one error of one can get bounce this guy. Uh, 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 this guy, this guy, this guy can have four values, I think. Fifth, 25%, 57%. So we don't do that, okay? But I just point out that's your temptation to do that. Let's have the next slide. Uh, this is that same data you just saw, but now it's been normalized, so it counts for 100% area under here. That's just so we can compare different countries or different governments, okay? Uh, that's called a PDF, probability density function. Uh, uh, the, the distribution function is this thing. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, but you often see it uh, uh, published now. This is the one that starts at zero and goes up to one. Okay. Uh, 
Next slide. We don't, we don't need that. We can use it, but we can get by with this one. Uh, if you take that data, and if you plot it, if you just all you do is hit the log function on your calculator or put log in your cell, and you plot that same data of the remaining, if it falls on a straight line, you don't know either. By golly, you've got an exponential distribution. You hit it. You're lucky. I made a good guess. It's by luck. I didn't know. Okay. That's the K that does it. It's the slope of this line. Okay. Again, you don't need to uh, uh, really do the math, but it's extremely straightforward. If you go back and plot, what we predict with this equation, which is the smooth line against our data points, we did pretty well. So, and, and we did that for everybody. Okay, the US, I like to this is concentrate on, because with so many data points, there's not a lot of mess in it. Let's have the next slide, please. Okay, that's what, that's what the US, that curve, I'll show you, and he had a bunch of bars that looked like this, which so showed the story, but I got it down to one equation. This just says every step out, every uh, for the second spell, uh, you, you're going to have 59 percent of what you had in the spell before. Okay, so that's your, your survival rate is 59 percent. Okay, election to election. Does it change over time? Let's find out. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, so that what I'm calling the K is just the slope, the, the 0.79, whatever, the 0.52, or 0.7 example. This is what we got for everybody we looked at. Now, I don't really, well, first of all, there's obviously some odd ones at the end. I'm little, uh, happy just to say it all the way, uh, because some of these countries had some odd histories. OK, but it is kind of interesting. They do kind of all follow in a family. And our subnationals, all the brown ones are national data. Subnationals, which have a lot more data, actually fall in pretty well. So this makes me kind of feel good that we're on to something that isn't just good for National and not subnational, just subnational. Mm -hmm. It is kind of a feeling. And uh, if, if if you want to argue, well, this one here says uh, USA is less than Canada, uh, probably true. Uh, but I'll let somebody like Al say, well, why that might be? It's just what it is. Okay, so that's that's the, the proportionality. Proportionality constants is what those are right over there. Next slide, if you please. Okay. This is plotting them out. Okay, now the, they're just plotted out alphabetically down here, so that's all significance. The bottom four are the four subnationals. They have a, a much higher degree of confidence because we could squeeze it in because we have so many more data points. And the more data points you have, the more sure you are about squeezing it in. If you have seven, five data points, you get some of this strange stuff. Uh, they are real erratic data points. So that's just an issue. So this is, you know, these are all the, the this, if you, if you can't read it, that goes Australia, you know, and just going down Canada, Germany, <coughs> USA. I, India came into a late pad. India would be another line there. Okay. It's good for comparing, uh, is this bigger than this? Because if their confidence intervals start to overlap, you start to think they could be from the same uh, data set. And the confidence intervals here is a tough one because these are exponential and you, you can't go by the old 68% uh, plus, plus or minus one standard deviation, 68%, 95 plus, that doesn't work. This is not, but this, this is that slope down for ground bell shape curve. But it at least gives you a sense for where we have most confidence. Next slide. Uh, okay, well, maybe I don't want to do the curve fitting. Maybe I just want to look at that L spreadsheet and pull out the spell length and see what how that agrees with K. It's actually a pretty good agreement. It's curve linear. Okay, but it's that, that's false uh, math. Okay, because the reason is uh, the for a given, well, let's put it this way, they're, they're not independent of each other. So I don't think any, I take confirmation that I didn't lie to you, but I don't think I've proven anything. Let's try the next one. Uh, okay, how often did they win? That'd be another way to guess what this proportionality cost is. That's not a bad way to go about it. But how often you won over history doesn't really say what your rate was per term. It is what you average over history. So, whereas it falls on the line here, uh, knowing a win ratio, somebody won 70% of their, doesn't mean they win in their election with a 70% chance. Maybe the chance is increased and then decreased. You wouldn't know. That's just another way to get it. I'm just saying, it could be. 
I can guard her in several ways. Okay, but I, I identify that for a minute. Let's have the next slide, please. Okay, let's look at that snake. Has anybody seen it? It's, it's red and white. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I didn't bring a cleaver, so we, we got scissors so we can go at it. Okay, let's chop the case apart. That's where it gets interesting to me. Okay, these six, I had to look up that backbones. They're dirt. Okay, this is a made up spell. Okay, but just for illustration. Okay, the other boat, uh, there's, you gotta read this thing. There's 50 right across, 50% right there. So this guy came in, this party of Democrats of Utah in 1941 or whatever, uh, came in with 54%, then they went up, then they went down, and they kind of bounced around what Al was talking about as the cruise. But this way we can say what the cruise was, and then crash. Got my red line. Uh, two ways to look at it. Uh, the red line is how much they crash from uh, the last election, which I say is bad statistics. The other is how much they crash from the mean election. The reason I say it's bad statistics, though, to uh, go for that one, is that everything, including this, everything here, is basically randomly bouncing around, and this could have just as easily, this, this, this point could have been down here, and this point could have been out there, and it looks like a bigger crash. Much better to go from the mean. The mean has also a smaller uh, variance itself, because this, this mean is the mean of six numbers, so it's, you know, it's, it's better like that than two, maybe on the square, two and a half, uh, squeezed out variance. So it's, it's just a better estimate. Okay, so this is what I call the micro. This is what I would call an engineering diagram, of a uh, uh, election cycle. Okay, listen to this dotted line. Okay, I was talking about the average. If you just said what you came in with, what you went out with, I came in at 54, I went out at 48, I did it in seven spells, that's a long, long, long last I had, but I, I finally went out. Uh, you know, by the, the, the difference by seven, and you get two and a half points per spell. Fake number. You didn't lose two and a half cents per well, what you might think if you had gone by the standard understanding, okay? Uh, so we didn't like that, okay? Although Alan quoted it in his book, uh, I said, I think you got it wrong. So we should have looked at like another chapter. Let's have the next curve, revise that chapter. Um, here it is. I just brought this out. This is a, okay, we had constant spells of, uh, this is a 10. Uh, crashes, I'm sorry, it yeah, didn't, it didn't vary too much, I'll show you some of that stuff. Okay, well if you lose it, all I mean, if you got the first election, you went down at uh, 9, or this is the U.S. day, you went down at 8% uh, per term, because you lost 8% of your, your votes, uh, you lost 10, well, okay, you, you lost all at one time, this, this way, if you didn't lose it for until the second one, it halves your average. Okay, so now you're losing four points per turn if you lose here. You know, well, this turns out that if you get into two or three, which the common rule says, you're probably about right if you lasted in this cell here, three, four, three or four turns. And that's what I rule really says. It says when we look at the average length of a government and we find out how much it changed overall, we get two and a half. That's how they did the calculation. I don't like it, never like it. Uh, okay, it's what I call a two or three percent law. Okay, it's by no means a law. Okay, and it's it's not only a law; it's a, a, a detrimental rule because it makes people think there's a law. Okay, there is maybe a law, but it's it's the law about cruising and crashing. It's not a law about constant rate. Let's have the next slide. Okay, and this is what we concluded. What Al said: uh, the cost. I'll, I'll say 10, would have changed the country. It's independent of how long you're in office, how many spells, you cruise along at the same rate, bounce around for sure, but you're always winning. So they don't bounce too low, and they probably don't bounce giantly high, you know, with 95%. Okay. Uh, and then at that point, they say the same crash, same penalty as the ones that crashed before, mm -hmm. even those that crashed. So, uh, so that's what I'll send right here. And this, this is probably our first finding. It's actually a meaningful finding, not the number we get. Let's have the next slide. 
Okay, so let's look at the wins and the losses. Those two numbers, for sake of argument, I'm going to say you cruise at about a 2% above the required 50 or 49 or whatever it is, 4% on your number. You crash at maybe 10% or 20% below that. Uh, okay, votes are uh, uh, fairly well winning, uh, sorry, incumbent, incumbent votes are pretty well normally distributed. Not really well because there's a lot of kurtosis, there's a, uh, not things are squeezed at this, this should, but the little, uh, big flights are high and come down and puts a normal distribution. That'll bite us a little bit at the end, but we can live with it. Okay, if you plot all that out, this is spells, I'll have this be a big loss. Okay, so I, I, I certainly don't assume you figure that out. Just think about what each block is. I try to get each, uh, I still have one total printed here, it's discrete, but I have it uh, on the even evers, or evens on the integer spells. Uh, an awful lot of one spell elections, uh, a smaller number of two, smaller number of three down to, and I think that this is, this might have been New Hampshire or somebody, uh, somebody lasted for 10 spells, okay, but not many. Okay. If you plot a slope through this, you might s say you see something, okay? Well, maybe you do, but let's do this. Let's take my normal curve, that thing up right there, and let's just say, I, I, said, I made a note for my own self at 52, it could be any place. Uh, you want to get, the winners are on this side, the losers are on that side. So I'll, I'm going to change a little bit to 52, I'll make it more like uh, 70. Okay, just chop them in two. Same distribution, but I'm going to use two halves of them. These are the losers, these are the winners. Nobody wins if they're down here. Nobody loses if they're up there. Each of these are distributions. They just happen to come together like this way. This is almost like a right-ear distribution. This is you know, sort of like a right -ear distribution, I guess. Uh, I want to look at these two distributions. Okay, so I want to look at the two halves. So it took us a long time to, to figure out how to say, do we ought to look at our statistics at just the winners <coughs> and just the losers? Well, here's where you really see the uh, stationarity of it. Okay, that slope is basically dead flat. The, 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 significance of the, the significance of the slope is nil. There's mathematically there's some meaningful number there, but the beta, if you put that in, is zero. Is that the next? Uh, okay, and the losers all lost, but again. There's an awful lot more than lost at one point, by one point than by 10 points. If, if you run a regression through all those points, it's pretty flat. The winners win the same, the losers lose the same, no matter what the election. Okay, again, I'll set so, so the question is, how can we turn that into uh, trying to get votes, because I've never used the word vote, I've got a said vote, I've never used a vote in anything I've said so far, other than just explain winning and losing votes. I haven't given any numbers. Okay, let's have the next slide. Okay, there's, here's, here's that same bell curve, a little more explicit. There's a normal curve. Statistics, at least uh, social science statistics, has a great dependency. Uh, to see to, uh, uh, they'll say everything, and I don't have any argument with it, but so it's, Probably not quite well shaped. That's the kurtosis I was talking about. This is just what history has given us in U.S. subnational elections. Okay, uh, a lot about 50. Okay, uh, there's a split I was just talking about. I think I split it at 52 because that's what it was. So that's the two sides that I just showed you: winners and losers. Let's have the next one. Let's look at the winners. Okay, so the question is. What's this worth in votes? You know, this is these are standard deviations, by the way. This is just a, 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 a standardized bell curve. Let's say votes down here. Uh, you got to know what the standard deviation is to turn it into votes. Okay. So what is this? How to solve that? Well, you might have ideas, and you might be right on track. Okay. But I'll tell you how an engineer would solve it. We would take this thing, 
could say, I won't do it very well. Close, I'm getting close. Where's the, there I go. Where's the centroid of this shape? I'll just move my phone. It's right there. That is the centroid, and you saw how I found it. Now I can find a mathematical one. No problem finding a mathematical one. But if all else fail, I can bounce the thing on my finger, and that would be the centroid. That's all you need to know. Okay, you know what the centroid of a circle is? Just a midpoint. You know what the centroid of a, a rectangle is? Centroid of a triangle is a third of the way over from the long side. Uh, this is a word. Okay, because this curve here is, uh, uh, the, the math is, is more complex. But it's just an equation. Okay. Likewise, so likewise there's a centroid on the surface. Okay, this is that other side of the curve. I find what a centroid is mathematically. So I, I'll get the right answer with my finger. Okay, it's right there. Okay, okay. that was two centroids. This will take a leap of faith on your part to say, why well, trust an engineer on this stuff? Okay, fair question. Okay, but you trusted an engineer, presumably because you're all sitting in it, to design that beam right there above you. Okay, same principle. Let's have the next slide. Okay, equivalent. The point being, I can take all the weight, you know, so I'll just stick with the green line, the winners. On the green side, on the winner side, I can take all this, which before I had on my balance beam, let's just do it, just, maybe you want to see it, so let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> There's how we're going to do it. Okay, this, let's see, let's do it like this. Okay, this assumes it's a balance beam, but I, I don't have the rest of the balance there, so I, I'm, I'm not seeing it. Uh, you want to see? That's all pushing down. It's like a whole lot of people sitting upstairs here, they all go to the far end to look at a, the prey going by. It's going to change the load on that beam. Okay. Well, you want to design that beam and you don't know. Okay. What you do is take that area, which went from where my nose is to where my nose is, went all the way. You move it over. Again, it's all mathematical, if you do it mathematically, but you don't need to do it mathematically. Rather than go from here to here, you move it over until it makes the same balance. Okay, that's the equivalent location. You can do that on both sides. Okay, this is what I'm calling the equivalent vote. Equivalent meaning engineers call the equivalent force. Okay, so we'll call the equivalent vote, because I don't know the main sites so that never use that term, I don't know. Uh, but no. They all will, because we <laughs> This is the equivalent vote. Okay, so, well, let's sit right here. The equivalent vote of the winners is about um, 0.6 standard deviations over. The equivalent vote of the losers is about one standard deviation the other way. Well, if you know what standard deviations are, and you know where the middle is, you know those points, okay? So at this point, it's just changing those equivalent votes to uh, let's set the next slide to their real numbers. Okay. I, actually, go, go back one. Okay, if you please. Okay, my question now is how far is it from here to here? From the average, this is the mean average win. Okay. Take all the winners, what they win with, what's their average. Take all the losers, what's their average. What's the difference here? If you want the two points, that's good too. But the big question is probably, what's the difference? Okay, this is statistics. This is not votes. This is just statistics. Okay, from here to here is a known distance when you know where this line is and you found this centroid and that centroid. Okay, so now the next curve, which will just have to take my oh no, we go into there. Okay, what I call the vote differential curve. Okay, and all it says is if you solve the thing, I did it numerically because I do not think a closed form solution exists, uh, but sorry, my tell me it does. Okay, if you put in a K, find the two centroids, okay, and then subtract the big one, the small one from the big one, you get 1.7 well, let's move, move, move down here in the north of the mid range. Okay, 
okay? You get these differences, okay? This is the differential between the losers and the winners, okay? Uh, and so, so those are just translated. So with that, and the math here is just substituting uh, standardized word numbers for uh, actual constants for your data, which are the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, to get it. So let's see how that works. Now let's go to the next one. Almost done here. Okay, we take the four subnationals. Okay, we have the real data. Okay, the dots show the real data. Okay, our model shows what I just showed you with equivalent votes. Okay, well, you know, I didn't hit it great, uh, but I didn't finagle anything either. Uh, and the obvious is not to hit it exactly, it's to see if you've got the right idea. This look like we're, we're probably closed in pretty well on the uh, uh, losing votes, but we are underestimating the winning votes. Okay, just said the winning votes for, for the US and it's like 58, 57, but really our, our model only showed 54. Okay, we missed. Okay, but that's fixable. Okay, at this point you're just adjusting your model and the way to, there's several ways to adjust it. Uh, the sophisticated one, which is beyond me, but I could figure out how to do it, would be go back and change my distribution. It's not bell shaped, it's really kurtosinized bell or whatever you somebody might call that, there's probably a name for it. Uh, I could probably find a research that work for it. The other is just apply a constant to it and say, well, we're off by this many points, but we have the constants in all sorts of equations, starting points, let's do it. Let's put those constants. Oh, no, this is just a dimensionless. It, it basically it shows simply um, um, uh, our, our, our model uh, doesn't, doesn't quite uh, do it. Okay, so let's skip it. So this is time to be Okay, if you put in those correction factors, we'll hit it exactly. I'm saying let's not go there. Our objective is not to hit it exactly. Our objective is to see if we're on the right track and then think of because I don't believe it's rational. Irrationally finding a number that goes so that it looks like if we kind of subtract the two from our means and uh, oh, we subtract two from everything to start with, uh, we might be a little bit better. Uh, I, I'm not arguing those numbers, uh, those numbers make it work, okay? And that's where we're at, okay? And I don't really think we're going to push it to make our model hit everything. This is four countries, it's going to be at in the end, there's going to be something else weird about them. Um, but, uh, that's, that's where I'm going to leave it. We started out, we uh, chopped up a snake. It must be somewhere. You <laughs> <laughs> find the slitter right on your foot. Uh, uh, chopped up a snake, looked at the eye curves, and you say, well, that eye curve is so obvious. Well, obviously, look at the, the team that came up with 2.5% uh, on average never looked at eye curves. They never chopped it up. Little pieces. They just said, oh, put them all together, that's what we get. Okay, if you look at eye curves, then you start to see the crash. If you start to wonder why you cruise at so much above why you crash, we chop up a bell curve to explain that. Did pretty well. Uh, we might do better. We, we might not even publish this, this last bit. Uh, it's pretty speculative, but if we do, uh, uh, I just asked Professor Butter about there. He says, I don't think he's ever seen that done before. I think he has to be done. And you've seen it introduced. And he's looking at all the statistics books and you go through all the possible curves of distribution. So maybe we haven't done that, but I'm not going to count on that yet. Okay, so let me turn it over to, a, uh, I'll turn it back over to Al, I guess. Well, I tell you, I've never seen a um, uh, Richard lecture before. Uh, we have been on the phone countless hours. We have gone through innumerable drafts. Uh, and argued sometimes, <laughs> as, as, it, as, as it can attest. But, um, but I've never seen him lecture before. Uh, Richard is, is just really great. Uh, he, he has humor and so on. Anyway, I just want a, a couple of more things. Uh, as you can see, we have the cruise and we have the crash and we have the flipping of the coin, right? The bias coin. The bias coin is K, which varies from about a little bit uh, above, say, 0.45, a little bit less than half, to about 75. That's a very, by, varies by country. So that's, that's the, the flipping of the coin. Now here, just a couple of more things I want to show you. Uh, this is actually looking, again, the subnationals. 
uh, divided between parliamentary or cabinet and executive. And this is <coughs> the um, spell length, again, back to the spell, spell length, spell length uh, by uh, party ideology uh, a year among the subnationals. And party ideology is shown here by callers. Sorry. Uh, party ideology is shown here by colors. So uh, a party that is on the left of center all the way up to minus one, or right of center all the way to one, sometimes I have to kind of 0.25 and so on, 0.50. And anything in between, like for example, sometimes some regional parties or parties whose ideology is ambiguous. Uh, so that would be uh, a yellow. So you can see that basically parties alternate through the entire um, time here uh, right, left, right, left, right, left. And uh, this conforms to something that Ian e. Budge said uh, in one of his books. Uh, he said that this is what democracy requires. It requires that there be frequent alternation between parties, one on the right and one on the left. And this then, on balance, it gets the policy right down more or less uh, the, the middle. Okay, now this is the last thing I want to show you here, and that is uh, basically we extend, began to extend this to the... Um, to the to Latin American cases, uh, we found three cases, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, and Uruguay that have a good democracy. Again, very few observations, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you can see the uh, uh, Costa Rica uh, pretty much in line with the others, and so is Uruguay, uh, and uh, Dominican Republic has a higher thing. All right, uh, well, I think we have covered uh, quite a bit of territory. Uh, I just want to uh, say a couple of final words. I want to acknowledge it is sort of um, it is uh, sort of um, <clears throat> conventional, right? Uh, customary to to thank people who have helped you, and of course uh, Richard uh, is um, uh, above all. Uh, but also I have uh, Re uh, uh, Mike Bundry who's back there somewhere. Uh, Mike, what are you? You please stand up, please. Uh, Mike uh, was wonderful. Uh, he and I worked together uh, many years. Uh, on president, American presidential elections, which got me into elections and eventually uh, to, this, to this work. And then I want to acknowledge the, uh, the comments and, and so forth by Ian Budge, uh, Caleb Clark, uh, John Carey, Joseph Colomer, who comes next, Alan Liptard, uh, Rain Tagapera, uh, and uh, Christopher Valaisin of the University of Texas. And I also want to thank, I already thank my colleague Michelle Williams, but also graduate students. Uh, we've had, uh, I've had a very fortunate to work with uh, several cohorts of graduate students over the last five to 10 years. And the, uh, I have acknowledged all of them uh, in previous publications, but uh, this year's is uh, Carter Edwards and, uh, and Grace Wheeler. And they have done really, a really excellent job. Really, a lot of drudgery, you know, sort of proofreading and proofreading and proofreading data. And finally, I wanna, uh, I wanna uh, I acknowledge my nephew, uh, Alfred Luis, uh, who did the two pictures of the cruise and the crash of the cars. So. Good evening. And uh, thank you for this invitation. I've been told to make some comments about Professor Kuzan and Hagen's findings, and also some suggestions based on my own work in order to try to first understand what they did. We had a lot of conversations before, email, in person. I'm not yet completely sure that I understood everything, but I think more or less. And then some suggestions on my own, okay? On the same topic, following up from their findings. findings. <clears throat> so, uh, let me say, first of all, there's a lot of interesting empirical findings here. Okay? So the, I, may, I, I read a few versions of your paper, so perhaps I'm quoting something old. But the total mean percentage points lost during a spell in office is near nine, per, nine percentage points at some moment, which means on average one fifth of it, its initial vote. Um, <clears throat> The reelection rate at some moment in your papers was 60%, which means that, as I understand well, 60% probability to be reelected means that the sec for the third term would be 
60 times 60, so 36%, and so on, right? As an average. So, which means, all of this means that, as you said, we can expect between two and, third, and three terms on average for eight to 10 years or something. I, uh, so you, you made much more precise uh, numbers here, but it is this vein. No? And then uh, what, what took my attention more is first that there is no significant differences between parliamentary and presidential regimes. That's very interesting. Because huh? I work uh, in institutions and this means that you must look at something which is not exactly constrained by institutions to explain these regularities. Huh? Another even more interesting perhaps is that ideology does not matter. So for both left parties or right parties, they have about the same numbers, same probabilities, and same performances regarding winning or losing elections, which is still even more interesting, actually. Um, <clears throat> so you say regular alternation between parties of the left and the right about once per decade on average is a feature of democratic politics. Well, that's a good finding. I mean, important. Then when Professor Cousin told me first time <clears throat> by email uh, the paper, Cruise and, ca and crash. I, th I thought that I understood that I didn't. At the first, my first reaction was, well, this looks, sounds like Hemingway's comment about a friend uh, who go bankrupt. And no, he asked him, how did you go bankrupt? And the other said, two ways. First gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> and, then, and they said, no, 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 it's not this. Uh, it's, uh, it's more constant and then crash, okay. And then, and then I said, okay, so that's like dying. Everybody dies, uh, and when you die, you die completely, right? Uh, and I said, no, yes, but, but because this would imply some deterior gradual deterioration, more or less, right? Uh, and it's, no, that's not the finding, okay. Uh, then is when I understood the metaphor about a crash. A car crash can happen at any moment, at the beginning of the trip, or at the middle, or at the end of the trip, right? So that's the idea, okay. <clears throat> These are inductive empirical laws, regularities. No? So you found some statistical regularities out of so many cases uh, about how parties lose or win elections. But, uh, I think if you want to be scientific, so to speak, we call, no, we call us political scientists, do political science, and science has the same rules for every field. Okay? Uh, in addition to empirical data, you need some logical hypothesis to explain what's, why it is happening, okay? or, how, or why it's happening this way. Okay? And... Uh, uh, <clears throat> So I think you have to, so some people say uh, the scientific study of politics should work on two legs, logical models and empirical tests about the consequences of, the, the expected consequences of those models to see whether they fit or not, or, or they are helpful or not to explain real facts. So uh, <clears throat> my idea is that your empirical laws inductive laws, as you say, uh, are still in search of an explanation. That's my feel about this. Uh, so, an hypothesis that, from which you can derive deductive implications to be tested empirically in your data. That's, that's what I can say. So, the point is, uh, <coughs> We observe for advance of much of democracies in periods of crisis, recently they are not performing, performing very well, and you can observe a lot of political instability, frequent government turnovers. I would provide a few observations about it that I think should be included in this discussion to make sense of the findings. Because, of, of course, so everybody can crash. Okay. But it's not the same to crash after, 
to, uh, uh, the first attempt to be reelected than to crash up after 10 reelections. Uh, you say it's exactly the same crash, okay? But why it happens after one term or after three terms or after 10 terms? That's a very interesting question, I think. No? And even more generally, if you want to be a little more philosophical, uh, why governments fall at all? Why are not re-elected indefinitely? If you say democracy is the less bad form of government, uh, well, the incumbent governments doing something that people can appreciate should be re-elected again and again and again. No? Uh, so, something happens that is, does not fulfill the expectation about how democracy should perform. Right? So, my, my point is, uh, <clears throat> the go governments fall, but the question is not only how and when, but the, another question must, could be why. Uh, why some governments crash at the beginning, or after a few terms, or very long term? And I think it's an interesting question, it's a relevant question. And then, uh, as you, uh, in your invitation, said, well, you can introduce some <coughs> uh, discussion about my own work, I'm going to make a few suggestions about it, about this question. <coughs> Basically, my idea is that governments fall because they fail. And what means they fail? That basically means that they don't fulfill people's expectations. Okay? Which may mean that they do a lot of things, but in some cases, the expectations were too high. So in some other cases, the expectations were very, very low. And then it has different effects on the chances of the government to be ready. And then you have some hints in your papers in that way that I think you could explore. So one is ideology does not matter, as I mentioned. That's very interesting. So a regular alternation between left and right views is independent on regularities about once per decade on average, which means that so all parties fail somehow once in government. They don't fulfill their expectations as completely in order to avoid losing elections. So you mentioned this, it would be interesting. And even more interesting, I think you didn't see, uh, you mentioned in the paper, uh, today in the presentation, but it was one of the last slides that uh, no, Professor Cousin made this first attempt to examine other democracies in Africa, Asia, Latin America, newer democracies. And uh, you may you show a couple of uh, three countries, right? <clears throat> but uh, as I remember your drafts, you said that in those countries, the cost of ruling uh, is on average two or three times higher than in these mat uh, those mature democracies. That's extremely interesting. We should look at this very well because it makes a big difference, right? Two or three times higher cost of losing uh, of ruling in order to lose a, a re-election attempt made, uh, so it means that there is a significant difference about the performance of governments in developed countries and in newer democracies in less developed countries. That's another thing. And the other thing that I'm not sure I understood completely, it's Professor Hagen K letter, the rate of exponential decay, uh, you said that, I understood the meaning, but uh, but you said that it's different in different countries, price across countries. Then, well, let's look at it. Let's look at the countries. Which countries is the rate of decay is higher than in other countries? So, if you enlarge the, the, this observation for other countries and, and you make it, try to make a distinction between different periods, I think you can try to understand more things. So why losing elections happens in different ways uh, for different parties in different countries at different moments? And that's my question. Let me add a little more evidence that can help to discuss these hypotheses. Just two points. Based on my own 
research. <coughs> democracy and globalization in some republics. And the first half of the book is about this, more or less. Not exactly about this, but I mean, it's the crisis of democracy. Second part is a bit more optimistic about things that can go well <coughs> in this complex uh, globalized world. world, world. Uh, but in the first part, <coughs> uh, there's a lot of data about two things. One, uh, one it was the traditional explanation about how governments uh, perform in elections included the idea that the, the, uh, the incumbent advantage, meaning the government, uh, so the party in office has an advantage when it runs in elections because basically because they can use information or manipulate information about their performance, uh, so uh, giving salience to their successes and not talking much about their failures. Uh, and, and then in any case, what they promise to do next time is weighted by the previous performance and people can believe that there's some positive likelihood that they, could, they, they are going to, to comply with their promises. Right? In contrast, the opposition can promise anything but it's also an hypothesis because we don't know whether this is going to be real or just a blah, blah, blah. So this was the idea, no? The incumbent government running for election has, a, has an advantage. <clears throat> well, this advantage is very weak right now. I would say the last 15 years in particular. We can discuss this, maybe longer, maybe a little shorter. But I was, uh, um, <clears throat> I was observing all these uh, events, especially since the Great Recession, which is exactly 15 years now, no? almost. <clears throat> and then in this period, in national democratic elections, the incumbent government advantage has almost disappeared. Let me just mention one obvious case that you know, uh, Trump, Donald Trump, failed at winning an election from the White House in contrast with nine of his 11 immediate predecessors. So the rule for 70 years, right, or more, was uh, more, 80 years or so, it was the incumbent is reelected. And then two terms limit, and then the other party wins the following election. Right? Well, it didn't happen this time. Right? Uh, but the US is not a singular case in this respect. So many voters, many places, are dissatisfied with the government performance, and they are voting for the devil and noun rather for that the devil now, okay? Just to put it in this traditional terms which was the idea of the incumbent advantage. So even if the new party is not known for any previous experience, perhaps not very reliable, <coughs> many people are so despair about the previous performance that they prefer a new one, whatever. Uh, say in Europe, for several decades, the governing parties won elections two to three times in a row on average, which is more or less what you say. But since the Great Recession of the last 15 years, and the pandemic, and now perhaps even the day, only one fourth of governments have been reelected just once. <coughs> uh, instead of being reelected two or three times, now, so only one fourth are reelected once. Okay? Three fourths are out of government after one term the, the last 15 years. And I met uh, this in my book, but uh, I met a more recent counting uh, for the last two years, say the pandemic, it did more or less. There was uh, elections in 17 democratic countries, and the uh, leading party of the incumbent government lost its bid for re-election 12 times out of 17. So about three fourths, eh? which is what I knew was very different from people were used to see. Uh, and then there were a few that were running for fourth or fifth term, 
and this was expected that they may do after so long. But there were uh, eight that were running, running just for a second term, and six of them lost. Okay, so even staying in the room just for one term. This is one thing. So incumbent advantage is vanishing. Second observation, so adding to the there is more political party fragmentation. Uh, some government parties are in crisis, new parties have emerged. It's more difficult to build a parliamentary majority, parliamentary regimes. Then the formation of uh, post electoral government majorities becomes more and more difficult. I can give you a lot of examples of cases. One measure that I tried to do for the last uh, mm -hmm. seven elections that we mentioned in the last few years uh, is something that is called effective number of parties. Know, which uh, weights the number of parties by their size. Okay? So larger parties come from almost one, or from more, but they're small parties. Okay? Well, in the 17 countries having held elections in the last two years, the average for the previous three decades, for the previous 30 years, was 4.7 effective parties in votes. Okay? That's my calculation. For the last two years, has risen to 6.2, so one third more, which means more fragmentation. Right? And then I can give you a lot of examples: so, Ireland, Romania, Spain, my original country. In Spain, there were four elections in four years, 2016 to uh, 2019, because after every election, the the parties were not able to form a majority in parliament to uh, appoint a government. And for another election, just to try. It was even worse, actually. And then they had to form a coalition that, just at one of the previous elections, the, the, the leading party had been said that he couldn't sleep if he had to make a coalition with that party. And finally, he had to do it. Okay? <laughs> and I want to make it part of this. But this was a few years ago, but now has, the record has been beaten. So in Bulgaria, there have been four elections, again, in a year and a half, okay? for the same reason, that they couldn't make a majority. And you know, Israel had been five elections in a little more than three years, and it's still not clear that this government is going to pass the right? So, uh, increasing fragmentation, increasing political party. Even the best governed countries have problems. Uh, so there is a, there's some list of the best governed countries. Uh, Germany was one of them. Right? Uh, for 60 years or more, uh, I'm talking about 70 years actually, the rule in Germany was two party coalition governments. Out of, now there are six parties in parliament. But uh, there were fewer people. But always two parties were sufficient to make a difference. They were a lot, all possible combinations. The Christian Democrats by the, with the free liberals, the, uh, the Social Democrats with the free liberals, the Social Democrats with the Greens, or the Grand Coalition between the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats, which was the formula for three of the last four elections. Okay? With two parties, they had a majority. With on the, the last election, no couple of parties got a majority together. It was more fragmented. And then they, for for first time, they had to do a three-party coalition to reach a majority. Even a coalition which is not clearly connected. It was the Social Democrats plus the Greens, but then the three liberals and some issues are on the back of the that's not a very consistent coalition. So even in Germany, they have problems with a government in this countries. The other case would be the uh, Netherlands, a model of great governments. Uh, they are used to have four party coalitions. And then uh, the last time they did that, it's our record. <coughs> which it took almost a year after the election to be able to form a majority in Parliament. 
So it was acting good. Okay, and then if you go to presidential regimes, no recent elections with Peru, Chile, Colombia, new steam candidates were on the steam right and the steam left, went to the second round, new parties were elected uh, for president, uh, the challenger won in all cases. <clears throat> so, fewer spells in your voting, shorter terms, but of the snap elections, uh, <clears throat> more instability, which means that your rules about rash uh, are happening like all that were the way you So, all women's eventually crash, and the question is how quickly, after the first victory, and seems to be much quicker than the rest of the So, then the, the, my question is why? Uh, <coughs> why are so big? So, these differences across countries, different periods, uh, <coughs> for the duration of the politics and the success of the economy. So, my idea is that they fall because they fail. And they fail because we are still even more than we were used to in search of efficient and socially accepted policies on numerous issues that are not settled. Right? For a long period of stable democracy after World War II, more about our parties of agreements and consensus about some basic policies, especially you know, economic policy, foreign policy. Right? Uh, that is <clears throat> but in the last period, uh, especially because the foreign policy for the world has not been dominant, as dominant as it was during the Cold War, now we'll see that uh, not still, not the only issue that we pay attention to. But in the last 15, 20 years, at least, or even more, there have been a lot of domestic issues that have, have emerged uh, in the public controversy. Uh, both about climate like, change, about integration, about race, about uh, family issues, about uh, gender, voting rights, guns control, many issues that are not settled down. I mean, there's no uh, policy consensus between the two parties. And, uh, and uh, permanently in the public, public debate, uh, that if you think about it, those issues already existed before, at least in some land before. But uh, but uh, sidelined by the focus on the economy and politics. And now, in terms of relative peace in international relations, the domestic issues, all these domestic issues, take much, much more prevalence. And, and there's no agreement. And some of these issues, even is not clear, which is the position of the parties in a lot of parties. Is there any things? Is there any position, any policy about an angle of this? Then, uh, <coughs> so that's my idea. Uh, governments fail more, a whole more often than they were used to because they fail due to a new agenda, a new set of new issues that were not previously managed to create policy consensus. And then, uh, and then the crucial thing is uh, many people, many voters, have better expectations about the government's performance. And now they are disappointed. And that many people are ready to vote for anybody except people. <clears throat> so then, then let me go to my own findings. Uh, <clears throat> can you uh, can you first? I assume many of you didn't read my book. If you, uh, some of you did it, don't answer, don't answer my question. Okay? Uh, so the, the question is no, it's not exactly the same, it's not how governments uh, fall. 
is a, a question that I think has some logical relationship with it. Can you? Okay, that's it. No, no. And the question is, uh, how satisfied are you with the way democracy works in your country? This is a typical question in, men, in some survey polls that they are doing periodically in almost every country, at least in democratic countries, uh, which are right. right? <coughs> and then, uh, <coughs> uh, so especially the Pew uh, Research Center is care about it, right? That, that has done this, this survey several times. And then, uh, then there are many different answers. So how, how much satisfied out of 100 are you with the way democracy works in your country? So my assumption is that being dissatisfied might be related to voting, voting against the government, or against the incumbent government. Okay? That's and then uh, I collapsed the sample I mean, the number of countries in these three groups. Uh, so when more than two thirds of population are satisfied with the way democracy works, would be number one group, but it's my group, my group. Well, <clears throat> when about half of the population between one third and two thirds are satisfied, dissatisfied, <clears throat> and when less than one third of people are dissatisfied, with the, work, the way democracy works. So uh, uh, let me ask you a few countries whether you can guess which is group one, group two, or group three. The group one is the more satisfied people, right? Group two is, uh, and then group three is by far a large, uh, a large majority of people dissatisfied. Right? Uh, let me remember the list. So let's start with the US, United States. What do you think? One, two, or three? Hmm? One, three? Oh. It's two. Okay? This is a couple of years ago. That's before the last election. Okay? Uh, still President Trump in office. Okay? Anyway. That might be a little bit better, possibly. Not sure. Uh, let's see, uh, Sweden. Why not? Right? Okay, Germany. They mentioned. What do you say? It's one also. I said one of the best governments. Uh, Canada. <laughs> Canada? Well, no, it's not obvious. No, it's not common sense. Yeah, no. Then uh, Spain, that I know well. Twenty-five percent only people satisfied. Right? Greece, if you remember the recent history. India. What do you think? Three, right? That's what you think? So that's my point. Expectations. In many countries, say in this list, US or how about Spain, Greece, Italy, those countries, <coughs> there were the expectation that they are developed countries, everything is going well, and our children will be better than us, and our grandchildren will be better than our children, and this that happen. Okay. So there's a lot of disappointment. High expectations are disappointed. Okay? I, 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 but in India, be <laughs> I'm serious. It, after independence in India, there were 40 years, 1952, the first election, until 1991, 92. For 40 years, the rate of growth of the per capita income of India was zero. The country didn't grow at all. At the time, there was a lot of jokes about it. The, the Indian rate of growth 
<laughs> but in the last 30 years, since the early 90s until now, is the first country in the world with highest rates of, of economic growth, now even more than China in the last few years. Uh, an average about 7% every year for, for, for 30 years. Never happened anywhere in, in modern times. Uh, well, even less in previous times. Uh, so then, people, of course, after this, they are extremely satisfied. As a new middle class, uh, so poverty has been reduced dramatically, etc. Uh, a lot of things to do, but you ask about it, how do you feel about the way democracy works in your country? Well, very <laughs> well. Right? So that's my point. So expectations matter more than actual potential uh, results. And then much of the problems of the of disappointment with democracy is the meaning of the word disappointment. You expect something and you don't get it. And that's why many people are dissatisfied and they are angry and they are ready to vote for anybody that is not in common government or the traditional parties because they don't perform as expected and they are deceiving everybody, etc. Which is not always a realistic description of reality. So many countries still work well in economic social terms, but not as well as before or not as well as was expected. Right? So then I tried to do a correlation. I'm going back to the papers, but I'm going, I tried in the book uh, per, uh, simple correlation, which is not final proof of anything, but trying to correlate uh, the, the dissatisfaction with the when democracy works with economic growth. Yeah. <coughs> and, uh, well, this, this is the number that, that I selected a few. This is a longer list of the countries that I, I selected, just a few for, for your questions, okay? But you see at the top is uh, satisfied on the right side, right? Canada, uh, Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany are the best, right? Uh, even, but, it, you, but the second group, you see Philippines, Indonesia, South Korea, India, most people satisfied, right? And in contrast, in Europe, high, high dissatisfaction in France, uh, UK, Italy, Spain, Greece, etc. Uh, okay. uh, and then, this is the correlation that I try to do. It's not the final word, but you see uh, average percentage of growth per, ca per capita income uh, in the last period, in a very recent period, uh, and this is the, the, the degree of satisfaction with democracy works, and you see India here, right? And you see Greece here, Italy, Spain, etc. Right? Uh, so that's my idea. So, uh, I mean, just a suggestion, no? Uh, <clears throat> there is a correlation between the government's performance, which can be measured in different ways. One, this is one of the ways of how the economy goes for the progress, right? And the, the degree of satisfaction with the, the way democracy works, which I think might be related with the uh, support for the incumbent governments to be reelected. That's it. Anyway, so uh, this is because you asked me to use my own findings to discuss. But basically, about Professor Kuzana Hagen's findings, I would say, Great findings. Uh, I would encourage you to develop those other countries that you mentioned in Africa, Asia, Latin America, to see the differences. I would say, if you have a very long term period, try to take it in different sub periods, especially in the last 15 years or so, whether it's different. You, we talked about it yesterday. You said, yeah, there's less relations in the most recent period. Uh, okay, that's what is in my way. So, and then uh, even more so, try to make a formal hypothesis to explain why governments fall, and to better elaborate on this on the basis of your findings. So the idea is you you need an hypothesis in order to uh, have some implications that can be tested with your empirical data that 
and I'm sure that really will be made to public. Thank you. All right, we have time for questions. Uh, well, you mentioned national governments, right? And and actually, right, Japan, India. But we could we could mention a few more. We could mention uh, the Mapai Party in Israel. We can mention the uh, Social Democratic Party, the Christian Democratic Party in uh, in Italy. Uh, several parties like that that really were very high, and then they they kind of crashed. Some have to run a little bit, but um, so why? Well. We don't know why. <laughs> the, the simple answer, right? So we know that K varies from country to country, but also even between periods. That's one thing that, you know, my, my time had run out, so I didn't want to go into that, but that's the thing we want to do. We want to explore, say, Italy, uh, Israel, and other countries where you had that, India. At the national level, even, even on the uh, uh, sub-national level, the same thing happened. The uh, National Congress ruled for a long time, and then, you know, basically other parties took over. So, why? Why? That's the question that uh, that uh, Professor Colomer asked me many times, right? Why? 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 And, and you know, I, I wrote him an email this morning. <laughs> I woke up early and I wrote him an email about this. I said, you know, um, and you know, we are, he and I don't agree in, in, in everything, right? Uh, Richard and I don't agree in everything, but uh, not most things we do. But uh, he, why, why, why? I said, well, you know, uh, in, in political science, my opinion, we have too many theories. Okay? We don't have any, hardly any laws, or any laws at all. Right? We talk about Duverger's law, we talk about uh, the, the democratic peace hypothesis, and um, uh, Richard makes fun of me because because I do think that we have laws, and but see because he, he studied physics, you know. Well, you know, social science doesn't have any laws. Well, you know, I, I disagree with him. We, <laughs> we do have laws, uh, but um, so I I'm interested in establishing the facts, right? The fact that different countries have different K's and and how this behaves and everything that we said here. My, my side and, and Richard's side. And I'm, I am less interested in why right now. You know, I want to get, I want to get the, how does the function work? How does it really work? Uh, and also, another thing that Dr. Colomero and I were talking about today, I said to him, you know, political science are always looking for explanations outside of political science, outside of politics. You know, uh, the economic system, the sociology, the uh, psychology. I said, I'm more interested in finding explanations within politics itself. Right, the, work, the very workings of politics and the state, uh, how can that help us understand how it behaves, you know, the various mechanisms? And I think that's what Richard and I are doing here. Uh, we're not looking for explanations right, right now outside of politics. We're looking at how it behaves and, and, and understand its behavior without seeking an explanation outside. Eventually, of course, you have to look at the whole system. After all, state and politics are part of a larger system, you know, economic, so, social, international. So the more you do that, but let's understand the system first, and then we can expand. So the short answer is we don't know. Uh, the second answer, to, to borrow something that my, my mother-in-law once said, uh, when she was you know, sort of declining, uh, I said, uh, Ruth, I said, uh, what year is it? And she said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> That's a good question. The only term limits are in uh, presidential systems or U.S. gubernatorial systems. But um, we, we don't look at the person as the incumbent. We look at the party as the incumbent, okay? But, but your question is, 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 is worth asking and, and trying to think about it because I think there is an effect. Uh, and that's another question that Richard and I argue about. <laughs> Uh, because in, in the gubernatorial systems, uh, not only I, but other scholars observe a bump 
uh, with the first uh, re-election uh, when the incumbent person uh, in, of the party uh, gets re-elected. And, but then after that, he cannot, re- be, he cannot go back, and so then it kind of seems to dissipate, right? So he and I work, you know, disagree with this, we work on that, and, uh, and, and, but I think there's something to it. Uh, so yes, I think, I think you're right. There, the persons do matter, uh, but don't, not, they don't matter as much as, you know, people tend, we tend to focus too much on persons and not on the party. Any questions for me or for Dr. Colomet or Dr. Hagen? Not many economic collapses like that. Well, uh, you can say 1970s, uh, early 70s, okay. Uh, two oil crises. But not for many countries, 2008 was a big disaster. I can tell you about many countries in Europe. I know Spain better than other countries, but also Greece, Italy, etc. The 15 years after the, the financial crisis, they are not yet at the level of per capita income that they were before. The number of people employed is still lower than it was before, even the population is bigger. So those countries didn't recover yet. They are better now than seven years ago, but still, if you look at the whole period, it's kind of flat. So it was down, down and up, but now still more or less the same level that it was in, well, lower than it was in 2007. <clears throat> so this has been a big shock uh, for politics also, because most many, Parties have just disappeared. You look at Greece, no party survived. In Italy, even, even more spectacular, no? the current government is a new party, never been in government, never had more than 5% of votes, now is leading the, part, leading the government, uh, etc. cetera. No? Uh, so uh, it could be, so you could try several periods, especially after World Cold War, I think that things began to change uh, with Clinton, basically, right? Uh, in the period. Uh, but uh, the last 15 years has been very significant for many democracies. For many advanced democracies, in economic, uh, has been significant uh, in economic terms. And then politically as well. No? But I can tell you many stories. No? Even France. Uh, no, France is supposed to be a more solid country. Well, look at the situation. So the, the last two presidential elections, the survivors of the second round were from two parties that had never been candidates at the second round in the previous 50 years. Uh, or more, 60 or 60, yeah, 60 years. Okay? Uh, and the two parties that were alternating in the presidency uh, for many decades, are in shambles. So the Socialist Party is less than 10% of votes, and the Republicans a little more, but never going back to presidency, probably. <clears throat> so I think it's a general crisis in the, in the most recent period, much bigger than in the previous decades. <clears throat> I think we have time for one more. No, I just want to... Uh... Give, a, give, give Lala a more serious answer. <laughs> I, I leave it to the party specialist to, 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 to kind of inquire into that, right? Uh, so we look at the system as a whole, so to speak, uh, the general patterns, but when you ask us about specific part, although I'm intrigued too, why these parties, you know, the Mapai party, the Christian Democratic party and so on, why did they kind of you know, kind of basically shriveled up and died, or, or almost died. Uh, but I leave it up to the people who study parties, like we have a colleague here who studies parties, right? Uh, Michelle Williams, right? So maybe you can ask her. <laughs> it's impossible. I've been in more or less in this country or close enough 
my first American election was 88. It was in the University of Chicago at the time. And I, I followed every one of them. And from the very beginning, I, go, I was from, coming from Europe, and uh, I was not bad at betting on elections in Europe, <laughs> OK? Uh, even sometimes when this party is going to be the third, or this party which is out of parliament is going to re-enter. I, I was doing so well. And then uh, in this country, I realized that was impossible. It's the most difficult prediction that you can do in any country. And it makes sense because, uh, so uh, let me put a little more academic, but this is a kind of theory, social choice theory. This is more formal mathematics about this kind of elections, etc. And one of the clear rules is the, the higher the number of, uh, no, is how is it? The, the, the more, the higher the number of voters and the most dispersed their preferences, the more, the more difficult to predict the winner because there are many potential winners that could form different majorities with different sets of voters, right? Mm -hmm. And the best example is the United States. So you say Theodore Roosevelt, Prospero, whatever. So there are many possibilities to form a majority that is not the traditional Democratic Party majority or the traditional Republican Party majority. And now it's changing that way, no? As you know, so apparently the last couple of elections, because I'm simplifying too much, but many Latin voters move from Democrats to Republicans, apparently, not yet the majority, but significant numbers. Many suburban women made the opposite travel. Uh, so there are changes, okay? And which means that different majorities can be formed by aggregating different sets of voters, right? Then it's very difficult to predict. The point is that the, the political system is very restrictive, extremely restrictive. It's the most restrictive in the world, mm -hmm. in democracy. I mean, because they have two formulas that no other party have together, which is single member districts for the Congress, which is the formula for Britain, of course, but still, no, uh, former British colonies, like the US, right? Uh, <clears throat> which permits only two parties to compete for the seat, basically, two candidates to vote for the seat. So very restrictive. And pre the direct presidential elections, which does not exist in Britain, okay, which are also more polarizing because only one winner <laughs> can get it, right? Uh, <clears throat> which is not the case in parliamentary regimes in which several parties go to parliament and they try to form a majority and there are several possibilities for different prime ministers, candidates, right? So, uh, <clears throat> think about it. There is no other country with this combination. There are many presidential elections, but mostly in large countries, especially middle-sized countries, with multiple parties, whether because they have proportional representation or some other rules that permit several parties to compete, like in France, for instance, but also in Latin America. And, um, but uh, another, the single member districts in Britain, in India, etc., are with Parliament of Canada, Australia, somehow, is with parliamentary regimes, not direct presidential elections, which means that after the election, there's a lot of room for uh, negotiation and agreements to make it possible majority, right? So this country is very restrictive in this sense. We talked about it this morning also, but uh, <clears throat> I can say it again. So I think that if, you, if I can be positive for a moment, uh, this is the cost of having been the first. So if, if you look at the, I, I, I've been studying the, U, the US, uh, Philadelphia Convention recently, which is, is extremely interesting. And then, <clears throat> it was a big experiment. They didn't know exactly what they were doing, right? And then uh, they invented so from scratch, right? With misunderstandings about the British system. They thought they were copying the British system. They didn't do it well because they thought that the king was still the chief executive and it was not anymore. <laughs> uh, they, didn't, they didn't expect parties. Parties were called, so, uh, corrupt factions, right, for all the uh, delegates. You remember Washington's farewell speech, don't have parties because this is going to be a disaster. No, and Madison, all oh, the parties are the worst thing, uh, etc. No, and then after 30 years or so, when all the founding fathers or whatever disappeared, 
No, the first five presidents were either authors of the constitution or the, I mean, or the independence of the constitution, of course. Right? And then uh, uh, for a while, they kept this idea. Okay? Uh, the best people are going to be elected. Okay? The most honest and uh, competent people are going to be the winners. But after 30 years or so, when those people disappeared, uh, Andrew Jackson, no, the first introduced mm -hmm. partisan presidential elections, which was the beginning of this conflict polarization between the two sides all the time, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> then, uh, so it's very difficult to make a prediction because the system is too conflict prone. Okay? And then uh, any, any side can invent something to try to create a winner. Uh, and even more, if you want a simpler answer, you ask me who is going to win the election. Well, tell me who is going to be the candidate. Right? You, can, you can make a prediction about who is going to win this football match. Who is winning? Who, who is playing? You know, who, who are the teams? <laughs> you know, is, this, is this team going to win the championship? Depends on the others, right? So we don't really couldn't know. Please join me in please join me in thanking our speakers tonight. Well, uh, post and don't crash on the way home. <laughs>